Hello, students of dynamics. This is Dr. Dan Baker. And today's lecture is going to take a look at the concept of relative motion. Okay, now relative motion is one of the key concepts that we'll end up using a whole bunch in the second half of this course. It's actually the basis of all of the rigid body motion that we're going to be computing. But we can also compute relative motion of particles. The basic idea of relative motion is that instead of measuring motion from a non-moving point, we can measure motion from something that's already moving. Hence, we'd have a relative motion between one point and another. If you haven't already watched the video here in this link, um, go ahead and navigate to that. I'll also paste it uh, in the description down below if you're watching this in YouTube, or you can just search for Agora in math movies, which are at Harvard, and it'll basically show you a clip. So go ahead and watch that video if you haven't, and then come back to this one. Welcome back if you went away, or we'll continue on here if you stuck with us. So what we saw in that video was essentially the mathematician Hypatia, uh, which was the woman on the ship. And Hypatia was one of the first chronicled female mathematicians and also astrologers and philosophers. And she lived at the end of the Roman Empire. And to be honest, I haven't watched the full movie. I look forward to, um, to, to seeing it. But in that shot, they're debating on fundamentally relative motion, trying to figure out where the bag dropped off the mast is going to fall ahead of the mast, behind the mast, or at the base of the mast. And so if we separate out the different terms, realize that there's three different velocities we're looking at. And this is true of all relative motion problems. One of those velocities is going to be the velocity of the boat. Another velocity we have is the absolute velocity of the bag. And then a third velocity that we have is the velocity of the bag relative to the boat. Okay, so we have two absolute, right? The boat is absolute. Absolute means it's measured from a non-moving reference point. Okay, so if we assumed in that video clip that the ocean wasn't moving or circulating and that it was basically like a lake, then we could assume that like the earth would be our non-moving reference point. The velocity of the bag is also an absolute. And then the velocity of the bag relative to the boat, this is our relative term. Okay, so two absolutes and one relative. Now we can actually draw the relationship between those. And so if we assume that the boat is moving to the left, we could draw here, here's my velocity of the boat. And so if you think about what they observed on that boat, watching the bag fall, right? Realize the bag was not stationary initially, right? The bag was moving at the velocity of the boat itself. But as they viewed that bag fall, it moved at the velocity of the bag relative to the boat, right? Everything was relative to the boat because the people were on the boat, the bag was originally on the boat. And so they're seeing it fall vertically, but that isn't an absolute velocity. It turns out that the absolute velocity is on an angle. And so if you weren't sitting on the boat and you were sitting maybe on a buoy or an island that was right next to the boat, you would have seen the velocity of the bag fall at a, um, at an angle, basically at a, a linear change here. Now it wouldn't have actually been, um, a linear path like this over its entire length. We know that due to gravitational acceleration, things speed up as they fall down. But at any one instant, right, thinking about that these are three different instantaneous velocity vectors, and that's one key, key thing to note here in dynamics is that pretty much everything we'll do will be at a single instant um, that we can relate these different vectors. Now these happen to be a right angle. It doesn't mean that all relative um, motion problems will be at a right angle. But let's go ahead and derive an equation that we can relate these three terms. We'll also see that this vector triangle could have led us to that same equation. So let's take a look at an axis system. Here we're going to have um, an origin point. This is a fixed point. Okay, so fixed as in we're measuring absolute motion from that point. Let's use an x axis and a y axis. Let's say here's point B. Okay, now we're dealing with particles at this point in dynamics. And so we have particle B, and we also have uh, over here, we have particle A. 
Now for both of these particles, we could go ahead and locate their position, absolute position. I'll use the same red as I labeled over here. So I could call this my R of B, right? Noting this is particle B. And then I also have my position vector from O up here to A. So here's my R of A. These are both vector terms. And then if I am sitting on point B, let's assume B is a boat and A is an airplane. Okay, so if you're sitting on a boat that's moving, essentially what you're seeing there is you have a relative axis system. Now this relative axis system, we're still gonna use an XY. Now the reason that we're gonna use an XY is because an XY axis system doesn't change no matter where you are in your motion. Okay, so if we chose a tangent and a normal, it would turn out that the tangent of the fixed axis system, the tangent of the axis system based upon B, the tangent of the axis system based upon A, they might all be different and that would be a mess. Now, there's one of those that wouldn't make a lot of sense. I said the tangent axis of the origin point, the origin point isn't moving, therefore it would have an undefined tangent direction because it has no velocity, but certainly each of A and B could have a tangential axis that are, that are different. Okay, so for using this relative axis system, right, and often we just use the first three letters of that talking about REL, the relative axis system, as we take a look at the position vector there of A relative to B, we could draw it like this. So this is R of, two ways we could write this. We can either write that as RBA, which is tended to be how we wrote it in statics. Here in dynamics, we write it a little bit differently. We write it um, in a relative form. And so this ends up being R of A, and then a slash, which you can always interpret that slash meaning relative to B. Okay, so essentially thinking about it's from the perspective, from the point of view of point B, is the motion of point A. Okay, so just write that out in words. We could say that R of A relative to B is defined as the position of A relative to point B where this relative to, if you wanted to put different words in here, you could say from the perspective of. Okay, relative to or from this perspective of are saying the exact same thing. So what we've done here is we've created a, a position triangle where fundamentally we're going from our origin point here to A, and we can get there on two different paths. One path is gonna go through R, B, and the relative position vector. The other one's gonna go straight out R, A. So it turns out I can, write a re I can write a relationship between these in the following form. We can say that, uh, we'll go here, so our R of A, right, from O to A, is the same thing as going along B, R of B plus R of A relative to B. Now one cool, really cool trick that you can always make sure that you write the correct relative motion equation is that the product of the subscripts always need to be equal. Okay, so let me put that in words, that the product of the subscripts must be equal. So what we're saying there is that A has to equal B times A divided by B. Okay, so I'm multiplying, taking the product of these subscripts. What I see is that B cancels with B, and I'm left with A equals A. And so that validates that I wrote this equation in the correct order, okay? Now here, not a big deal, right? Only a handful of variables. I often actually remember 
that whatever my relative term is here, and if I write it in this order, essentially that my, whatever the term is on top of the slash shows up on the left-hand side of the equal sign and below the slash shows up on the right-hand side of the equal sign. As we get into rigid body motion and as we get into acceleration of systems with, that have what we call slipping velocities, this is in section 16.8 of the Hibbler textbook, it turns out that we get up to, I think there's eight total terms in your equation between the tangent and the normal. Um, let's see here, there's six, seven, eight, there's actually nine terms overall. And so with nine terms, it's really handy to be able to cancel these subscripts and make sure that you've written all the relative relationships correctly. Okay, so a good thing to practice here early on so that when we need it later, that we have that in our pocket. So as we look at this equation, we know fundamentally from all of our chapter 12 work that as we take a time derivative, a DDT of a position function, we can end up with a velocity function. Now, if you remember, as we looked at the tangent normal, we had time rates of change of both the direction and also the magnitude of various terms. But because we're using an XY coordinate system, we're not gonna have a time rate of change of the direction of the axes. We're only gonna have a time rate of change of the magnitude of these terms. So it turns out the time rate of change of this equation of all the different terms is pretty straightforward. We end up with VA is equal to VB plus the velocity of A relative to B. Now, noting these are vector terms. These are not scalar values. The only time that it would be true that you could just add the values together of B, so say here, the velocity of B plus the velocity of A relative to B was if everything was one dimensional, right? That all your motion was in 1D. If it's in 2D, which is what we'll focus on, or 3D, you need to convert these into vector terms. And then essentially you'd end up with multiple equations because you could take the X version, the Y version, and the Z version if it was three dimensional. And as the last step here, of course, we could take another time derivative and that will get us to acceleration. So as we take this time derivative, we find out that this is still going to be in the same order, acceleration of A, acceleration of B, plus the acceleration of A relative to B. Now these are the total accelerations. And so it would turn out that fundamentally, if any of these particles were moving in a curved path, we'd have to include both their normal as well as their tangential. But still, this holds true that um, the tangential and the normal components, now they would be converted into xy, right? They're converted into xy because we're using an xy coordinate system, as we showed in the diagram up here, for all of the different components. So we convert everything into xy, and in doing so, we can, we can have a homogeneous coordinate system that's true for all particles in all positions and on all paths, um, as opposed to a tangent normal, which varies by location. Okay, so these are the three fundamental relationships of relative motion. And we can see that they have the exact same structure, no matter if you're looking at the position, the velocity, or the acceleration. So coming back over to the, um, the ship and um, Hypatia, we can see that we could write an equation between these three different terms. If we think about our start and our end point, there is our start point, here is our end point. And so here we could write the velocity of the bag as an absolute term is equal to the velocity of the boat as an absolute term plus this relative velocity they observed on the boat, the velocity of the bag relative to the boat. And we can see again that you could cancel if you wanted to, multiplying those subscripts, cancel boat with boat and get bag equals bag. So this would give you some computations if you wanted to, to basically figure out what an unknown was in this system. Now, the last thing to highlight here before um, closing out this video is that we really have to think about each one of these vectors is made up of both a direction and also a magnitude. Okay, so you can actually list out if you wanted to for the velocity of the bag, the velocity of the boat, and the velocity of the bag relative to the boat. 
okay, that each one of these has a direction, and each one of these has a magnitude. It doesn't really matter if you list the direction column first or the magnitude column first. But what we're, the reason I'm doing this is to show that there's really six unknowns incorporated in these three vector terms. Okay, so as you're solving any of these problems, it's really valuable to make a little table like this, figure out what your knowns are, figure out what your unknowns are. You can only have two of them. The reason that you can have two is you can split each one of these equations into an X component equation and also a Y component equation, right? Because they are vector equations. And we'll see that quite a bit through the class, is that any of these vector equations on a two-dimensional problem yield two equations to solve for two unknowns. Okay, so just a little note here to say that we have a max of two unknowns in a 2D problem. So I hope this gets you started on the right foot on this idea of relative motion. And once again, this is relative motion between two moving particles. I think really the key term in all of these problems is finding this relative term. Once you find the relative term, the absolute terms kind of line themselves up because the relative term is relative between the two absolute terms you have to consider in that same equation. Okay, so focus on what is the relative term, um, or you can kind of do process of elimination as you set up one of these tables and figure out what are the relatives, what are the, the two absolutes, the one relative, and you're off to the races. Hope you're having a great day.